Why did Sukuna split his soul into 20 fingers as opposed to just one? We're going to be talking about that and a few other questions I've gotten ever since JJK ended. So strap in, but spoilers beware. All right, so our first question today comes from Bakari, and he wants to know, why did Sukuna split into 20 fingers when he presumably could have just done one? Because they were invulnerable either way, right? So the 20 fingers wasn't a function of just trying to make sure at least one of them survived, because... They all did, right? So why did he do that when no other incarnated sorcerer split their soul so much? So first of all, this was never explicitly addressed in the series, so we have no canonical answer to this. Everything I'm about to say is just pure conjecture, but let's talk about what we know, right? And that is that Kenjaku is the one who showed Sukuna how to do this. So at the very least, the first time this happened back in the Heian era, when he became 20 fingers, it was... Kenjaku in the driver's seat. So it might be that just Kenjaku was not capable of containing Sukuna within a singular finger. Perhaps that was just not within his wheelhouse to take on a task that massive, if you will. But we know Sukuna, after having the process explained to him and shown to him, was capable of copying it and mimicking it, which we see him do later in the series when he transfers to Megami. And at that point, he does contain all of himself, at least all of him at the time, which was roughly 15 fingers, into a single finger. So it should at least be possible to contain all of Sukuna within one finger, but maybe Kenjaku was not capable of that. So that's at least one possibility, right? Another possibility could be that it was something Kenjaku uh, forced upon Sukuna. Maybe he told him that, hey, we can't contain you in one. I'm going to need you split up into 20. And that might have been a lie in order to better manipulate Sukuna and basically pull the strings as he wanted them to be pulled. Now, again, we aren't given too much light on exactly the dynamic and what Kenjaku wanted out of this relationship. But at the very least, we know that he created Yuji to be a prison for Sukuna. So Kenjaku wanted to make sure that he could have the reins on Sukuna for as long as he needed them to and in order for things just to not go completely haywire, right? So perhaps splitting into 20 was also his way of making sure he could keep things under his control until the moment where he needed and would allow Sukuna to basically have free reign, right? We know they had a binding vow that basically protected Kenjaku from Sukuna, and, you know, Sukuna was going to help Kenjaku with the merger. Again, we don't know the full details of it, but at the very least, I could see the 20 fingers being a way for Kenjaku to help control Sukuna, if that makes sense. Now, like I mentioned, all of the fingers were invulnerable, so it doesn't seem to be a product of just making sure one exists for the next thousand years, but splitting them up could be a way to help him find a new vessel quicker. This would be like a whole other angle as to why there are 20, right? And that could be because we know how toxic they are. It's like one in a million for somebody to even be a Sukuna vessel, right? Well, if you only have one finger, your chances of ever finding that vessel are far slower slimmer than if you have 20 fingers out there, each potentially interacting with potential vessels, right? Especially if the 120th is less toxic than a singular full power finger, if we want to think of it that way. Now, I don't know if that correlates or not. Maybe they're the same toxicity, but it's at least possible, right? So that could be another avenue for why you would have 20 as opposed to one. Next up, we've got another Sukuna question here from Next Level Hero, who says, I remember in one of your videos, you said Sukuna would beat Gojo in his hand era form even without the 10 shadows. But I wanted to ask you, how would he go about this and get through Infinity? So this is something I've talked about at various points in the past. And even, I want to say it was probably like, maybe even six months ago at this point, I put out a whole video about Gojo versus Heian era Sukuna, aka Sukuna without the Ten Shadows. And to be clear here, I wouldn't say that he would beat him as it's like a foregone conclusion. I think either one of them could win, meaning Sukuna without the Ten Shadows is capable of beating Gojo, but he doesn't just like slap him or anything. I think Gojo is also capable of winning that fight. So I'm going to link you that video. But again, since it's six months old, that was before a lot of the events of the manga finished. So it might be outdated in some parts, but definitely like the main points that I talk about there are all still true. And how Sukuna would get through Infinity and be capable of beating Gojo without Maharaga in the World Cutting Slash is simply his domain expansion and domain amplification. Domain amplification is a way for his physical strikes to get through Infinity. We've seen other characters do it as well. Sukuna even did it 
in their fight. Uh, so that's at least a win condition and a way for him to hurt Gojo. But then beyond that, the main win condition would be Malevolent Shrine. As we saw in their multiple domain clashes in their actual fight during Shinjuku, um, they were equally refined, but Gojo was definitely fighting the uphill battle in order to find a way to equalize against the open barrier of Sukuna's, right? So not that Gojo wouldn't be able to similarly find a way to make that an equilibrium and basically negate each other's domains. Uh, I think he could do that, which is again why I think it's a toss-up and either one could win. But the fact remains that that is a win condition for Sukuna because the domain also bypasses infinity. So there are ways to get it done. And again, I yap a, a bit more in depth about it with a bit more nuance in the video that I'll link to you here. But yeah, uh, like I've said multiple times, I really don't feel comfortable saying that like one beats the other every time or anything. I think they're pretty equal. Next up, we got this generous donation from Sil Businessman, who also happens to be a YouTube member. So thank you so much for all the support, man. And again, if you are a YouTube member and you're in the Discord, make sure you're linking your YouTube in your Discord so you can access our members only channel. But uh, y'all pause to read this since it's a bit of a longer one, but he's got a few questions in here. The first is, um, I know you probably have JJK far from your mind. Of course not, never. But I can't help thinking about a sequel because of all the unanswered questions. I know you touch on this a bit, but what are some things you'd like to see explored, if any? And I, I know you said you saw me touch on this a bit, but I'm not sure if you've seen the video where I talk about, I think it's like 15 different things that I wish had gotten explored more. So that is my best answer to that question, and I will link it in my response to you here. But the very short version is just more world building. I would have loved to just have fleshed out more of the lore, whether it's about the stuff in the Heian era, whether it's about the societal structure of the three big clans and how that came to be, Tengen, Kenjaku, all that type of stuff. Just more world building would be the number one thing I'd want to see from a potential sequel or spinoff. Uh, and I actually have had, th I've been thinking about like hypothetically if there was a part two, what would I want it to be about? Like in terms of like the main plot line. Uh, so I might make another video once I've had like more time for that to marinate. Um, but yeah, I'll link you the 15 things video in a response to this comment. But then we've got some other just follow up questions here. The first is what's the deal with Panda? So I'm assuming you're meaning like, how is he still around after what happened during his fight with Kashimo? Uh, but if you're asking about like, just what is Panda in terms of a cursed corpse? I think I put a video on that out before. If I haven't, I'll make one at some point. But he survived Kashimo because he is a cursed corpse with three cores. And basically Kashimo destroyed two of them. So Panda his siblings, the Triceratops and the um, ape, are gone, and he just exists as Panda now. So I guess that's how he was basically able to like regrow his little baby Panda body from his head. But that's basically something that was never fully explained. But the reason he's still around is because only two of three, two out of three of the cores died. Uh, the next is, are they going to travel to the other countries to hunt the reincarnated sorcerers? And that did seem to be the vibe that they were going to use Yuji's soul capabilities and Angel's curse technique in order to save the rest of the vessels of the incarnated sorcerers, to strip the incarnated sorcerers away from them the same way they stripped Sukuna from Megami. So I would imagine that is the plan. Um, and then what's the status on the other, or what's the status on the other clans? Great question. It does seem to be that like society was given like a positive uplifting note toward the end with Gojo's dream being realized and the people in positions of power like just being better people. So hopefully the clans are going to remain at peace, but you know, it wasn't something that was touched on too heavily. Uh, and will Sukuna reincarnate? I mean, his twin did. So what if he could do like a disaster curse? And I've actually gotten a follow up comment. Uh, so we'll look at this in a second. But I did talk about the disaster curse stuff as it relates to reincarnating and Sukuna in a previous video, which uh, Sylv did see. But yeah, Sukuna is not a curse in the same way that uh, like Mahito is. So his reincarnation wouldn't be the same. But he could theoretically reincarnate the same way his twin brother did in that his soul might eventually like re-emerge in a new human vessel right but if that's the case he probably like wouldn't retain his memories uh you know this that type of reincarnation isn't something that gege really touched on so we don't really know for sure what that would look like but theoretically uh he would be in the some sort of cycle of rebirth and potentially be born again one day right uh the next one is uh could there be other disaster curses hidden around the world and i think so probably less likely in other parts of the world but certainly in japan
This is something I have talked about before in my video, Are There More Disaster Curses? where we basically do a full breakdown, explain what disaster curses are, how they form, and all that jazz. Because it's not really an official designation, it's more of just a nickname for them, and it basically just means a very powerful curse that's representative of a collective human fear, right? The ocean, fire, uh, humans themselves, as far as Mahito, Mahito goes, right? And then Hanami is nature, right? So could there be other collective human fears that are very strong curses, and I think for sure. But I think they would be in Japan as opposed to the other parts of the world because of Tengen's barriers. Those are what have optimized cursed energy and allowed for the existence of powerful curses and sorcerers in Japan. Yes, some things still exist outside of Japan and outside of those barriers, but I'm not sure that something as powerful as a disaster curse would be capable of forming outside of those barriers. And then finally, here is the follow-up comment from Silv after he realized I talked about the disaster curse reincarnation stuff in my previous video. He says, is Sukuna strong because he is Sukuna or is Sukuna, Sukuna because he is strong? And this is also something I've talked about, the very same question as it relates to Gojo, right? Are you Gojo because you're the strongest or are you the strongest because you're Gojo? Basically, is Sukuna a product of hard work or talent? And uh, if I remember, I'll link that video as well. But I think the answer is both, the same way it is for Gojo. Gojo, right? Yes, Gojo was born with the six eyes and limitless, also obviously a silver spoon in his mouth, but he was also an insane prodigy, right? A genius when it came to jujutsu, and he made the most of it. I think the same is true of Sukuna. He was born not with the six eyes and the limitless, but with four arms, two mouths, uh, and basically the perfect body for jujutsu, right? So he, in his own way, was born with a jujutsu silver spoon in his mouth, uh, but he was also an insane genius, right? So I think it's a product of both. And then this other thing you touch on is an idea I've loved and we've even speculated about in various videos over the past, you know, however many months, but this idea that could the legend and infamy of Sukuna grow to such an extent that he would become a collective fear of humanity. So even though he himself is not a curse, could a Sukuna curse spring up from that well of negativity surrounding him? And I think that's a really cool idea, but we do know that it takes like so, so, so much cursed energy over potentially hundreds of years to coalesce to form something like a disaster curse. And obviously, Sukuna traversed time via being a cursed object. So, you know, his legend has existed for at least a thousand years. Uh, so if that was something that stayed mainstream and continued and like just was a constant thing people were worried about, as opposed to like more of an urban legend, uh, then I think it would be possible for like a disaster curse built from the fear of him to spring up. And that would certainly be a cool idea to play around with. And then last but certainly not least, I got this generous donation from Rakim, who didn't include a question, just said, just because no real reason. So thank you so much for the support, man. Anyways, y'all, that's going to do it for this one. Thank you guys so much for your kindness and support. It really means the world to me, even more so after JJK ends, because you know I love any excuse to dive back into this canon and yap JJK with y'all. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. And if I remember, I'm going to try to. I will try to provide links to all the videos we referenced in the comments below, but y'all yell at me if I forget. I think there's at least two or three videos I need to link. But again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you soon.